Alright guys, how's it going? In my last video, my 20k subscriber video, I talked about buying Polaris and Pascal, one of the cards each. And I'll be having a really close look at the cards and doing benchmarking, that sort of thing. And as you know, I do tend to go the extra mile with these things. It got me started thinking about it. I started to think about what benchmarking should actually be like. Everybody should be buying graphics cards based on how well they benchmark. Now generally speaking, stuff like image quality remains the same. Nvidia's got one or two little things with Gameworks obviously, which makes their games look better in some cases. However, most of the time it's not really worth the performance hat. So yeah, this got me thinking about how to benchmark. What is the best way to do this? So I started having a little look through the history of how this was done. And it's actually quite interesting to see how it's changed over the years as both companies try to get a leg up over the other. Around about five years ago things were an awful lot simpler. Both AMD and Nvidia had graphics cards and they were benchmarked against each other. Every card had a reference spec and even though there were overclocked versions, the overclocked versions were only ever benchmarked against other overclocked cards or in their own reviews. You would never expect to see an overclocked card in the main review of a launch day reference card, but this changed. Back when Nvidia was struggling with Fermi, they were under some real pressure from AMD who were pretty much on fire at that time, but Nvidia had launched the GTX 460 which was actually a pretty decent graphics card considering how bad the 480 was, but they had launched the GTX 460 in July and things were starting to look up. AMD had left quite a big gap between the 5870 and the 5770 and the GTX 460 slotted in very nicely in there at a good price and it went on to become a very popular card. Now I've talked about this before but AMD was a mile ahead on DX11 at this time and it was only three months later that they were ready to launch their BARTS GPUs. That is the 6870 and the 6850. The thing here is they were much smaller chips, more power efficient and faster than the GTX 460. Nvidia knew what was coming here and it wasn't looking good so they decided to change the rules. Basically speaking, years of the unwritten benchmark rules were thrown out. What they had done was managed to convince the tech press to use a heavily overclocked EVGA model in AMD's 6870 and 6850 reviews. Now as you can see here, every other card in this benchmark is reference, but you can clearly see at 55 frames per second the EVGA GTX 460 1GB for the win overclocked. Now this card was about 27% faster than the average GTX 460. It made the card look much faster than what it was. The EVGA version was almost tied with the 6870, a graphics card which is really on par with Nvidia's 470 graphics card. If you look down the bottom you can see that Anantec also used the reference version of the card and in most cases it was struggling to keep up with the HD 6850, let alone the 6870. So Nvidia had really changed the rules of the game there. Now there was a massive falling out over this. It might seem rather tame these days because we see overclocked cards all over the place mostly Nvidia cards it has to be said, but this simply was not done back then. The Anantec forums were in an uproar over it and as you can see here the 619 comments for the follow up article your feedback on the use of EVGA's GeForce GTX 460 for the win in last night's review. Now looking through the article, a number of you responded in the comments to the article very upset that we included the EVGA card, even going as far to accuse us of caving into Nvidia's pressure and demands. This was quite an eye opening article back then, but let's start with the obvious. Nvidia is more aggressive than AMD with trying to get review sites to use certain games and even make certain GPU comparisons. Annan goes on to say that both sides, correction all companies, have done nasty things in the past but you come here to read about products, not behind the scenes politics, so we've mostly left it out of our reviews. Nvidia called asking us to include overclocked GTX 460s in the 6800 series article. I responded by saying that our first priority is to get the standard clock cards tested and that if Nvidia wanted to change the specs of the GTX 460 and guarantee no lower clocked versions would be sold, we would gladly only test the factory overclocked parts. Of course Nvidia didn't change the 460s clocks and the conversation was ended at that. Again, they mentioned the 26% overclock on the card, basically pushing it to a performance level that should have been a new product entirely. This is the point here, yeah? People may think, well, what's wrong with including an overclocked card? But what is wrong with including overclocked cards is, Nvidia can't guarantee that no lower clocked versions would be sold. It's the same nowadays. However, you see so many different versions of heavily overclocked cards, for example, the overclocked 980 Ti's. You very rarely see the reference version, but the reference versions are still being sold. It is a bit of a muddy area, but what it comes down to is, if Nvidia could guarantee the clock speeds, then why aren't they doing it? And the simple answer is, they cannot guarantee the clock speeds. 
five years later, and it's simply the norm. And this is one of the problems here, because over time, it just became the norm to include overclocked graphics cards alongside the reference cards. It's fair to say that Nvidia cards generally overclock better, but remember that that may not always be the case. What it really comes down to is consistency. Some samples overclock further. Overclocked cards generally use more power. Which power numbers do you use? The whole point of the reference card was to give a reference value, but that now appears to be gone. I'm not entirely sure how to deal with that. You tend to find that the high quality sites like Anantech still only use the reference values. Simply put, it gives that consistency. So that's one thing that is very worth thinking about and I'll be interested in knowing what you think about that. When benchmarking, what is probably the most important factor is which games you actually benchmark. And funnily enough, both Nvidia and AMD have slightly different ideas of what constitutes a good game to benchmark. AMD will talk about Ashes of the Singularity for obvious reasons. And as you know, AMD generally looks very well positioned in DX12 anyway. When you're seeing stuff like the 290X beating the 980 Ti, it really does hammer home just how much of an advantage that they appear to have. And Nvidia's 970 is languishing way down with the R9 380 in some games. It is still interesting to note that Hitman was mentioned on the Nvidia site as being day one driver ready. So they have actually been working quite closely with the Hitman developers, but for whatever reason, they're just not close. And then we've got the opposite side of the story, Rise of the Tomb Raider. Everybody was expecting this to be yet another walkover for AMD. However, Nvidia started advertising the game heavily and it soon became apparent that we were looking at what is basically a GameWorks title. The benchmark scores are very much reversed, with the 980 Ti well ahead of Fury X and the GTX 970 well ahead of the R9 390. This is really not what we're used to seeing, especially not in DX12. So really what we have here is a case where it is extremely easy to make one company's cards look better than the others. If I want to make AMD look good, I will use games like Ashes and Hitman. If I want to make Nvidia look good, I will use games like Rise of the Tomb Raider or some GameWorks titles. So this is something that you need to look out for in the press and it's also something that I need to think about as I begin benchmarking. Now on the same DX12 topic, Gears of War gained notoriety for being utterly broken on AMD hardware at launch. It didn't exactly run great on Nvidia hardware, but it was completely broken on AMD. And that was the big story. It's pretty rare for sites to go back and rebench. What you tend to find though is that after a patch or two, the performance is fixed. And here is a prime example of it. With Gears of War utterly broken on the Fury X on day one, that's the white bar, now appears to work absolutely fine after the latest patch. This is a real can of worms here because it is very easy for either company to hobble day one performance on their competitors' cards. We see it all the time. Most people would simply assume that Nvidia is better in Gears of War, but judging by what we see here, where the R9 380 with the new patch is around 10% faster than the GTX 960, we're really looking at some kind of normality in DX12 here. What this really comes down to is two things. What games do you benchmark? Because that is the most important thing. But it's not only just what games are important, it is also the timing that is important. Most people are interested on how the game performs on day one. But how exactly do you deal with a situation like Gears of War, where the game is maybe broken for two weeks on AMD hardware, but is now faster and performs better in most cases? I would be tempted to say, any game that is utterly broken on one vendor's cards on day one should not be benchmarked at all. Because it probably shows that either the publisher or the developer simply didn't care about one side or the other, which to me means money changing hands, or let's just call it co-marketing, which is basically the same thing. Up till this point in the video, you've probably been able to detect a slight undercurrent where the suggestion is that Nvidia gets up to these kind of shenanigans a bit more often than AMD does. It's just like what Anand said five years ago, Nvidia does get up to this more, <laughs> there's just no getting away from it. They're pressurising websites a lot more, but that doesn't mean that AMD isn't doing it. And in fact, they are. And they've really started to do it a bit more recently. One example of this was seen when the Fury X had a performance leak around about one week before the proper reviews landed. Now this showed a bunch of games where the Fury X was ahead of the 980 Ti. A couple of things are not quite right though. When you look at the presets, the anti-aliasing type and the anisotropic filtering, as well as the settings, you can clearly see that AMD has cherry picked their very best performance they could find. Now this is 4K, so you can sort of expect anti-aliasing to be at lower levels. Yeah? Yeah, that's fine. Also settings as well, but turning off anisotropic filtering, that's just a complete nonsense. You would never do that. The only reason AMD is doing this is because when they had the anisotropic filtering turned on, the performance likely tanked. 
So what you have here is AMD basically handing over the very best case benchmarks that they could find on these games. What this does is it puts pressure onto the reviewer to also find numbers similar to that. In the end, none of them really fell for it. As soon as I saw this table, I knew that Fury X was in trouble against the 980 Ti because if AMD had to go to these lengths in order to beat the 980 Ti, then it wasn't going to look good on the average benchmark site. We all know how that one ended up. Now this leads me on quite nicely to the next part of the video, because here over at Tech Power Up, the R9 Fury X, relative performance at 1440p, this was on launch day, and you can see here that the 980 Ti was 9% faster, if you compare against the green bar. However, on this day, Tech Power Up added two new bars, Fury X without project cars, and Fury X without project cars and WOW. And you can see here that without project cars in the benchmark, the Fury X was now only 6% behind, and without project cars and WoW, it was only 5% behind the 980 Ti. What this comes down to here is, these games are outliers. If you check the contents of the review, we can see Alien Isolation at 7, all the way down to World of Warcraft at 28. So that is 22 games tested, which is actually an awful lot, and one of the most that any website will do. But it clearly shows the issue here. Just look at the project cars benchmark, where the Fury X was well behind the 780 Ti and the GTX 970, let alone its true competition, which it was 50% slower than the 980 Ti. Now World of Warcraft is slightly different, however the Fury X is still behind the 970, yet it is still getting 125 frames per second. In a case like this, WoW is costing the Fury X 1% in what is basically a pretty old game that has always run very well on Nvidia hardware. In a case like that you may say, well you know what, 1% loss there, that's fine. But looking at project cars, a game that causes a 3% loss, which is an awful lot over 22 games, for one game to be causing a 3% loss when 22 games are being benchmarked, then that is a clear outlier. Now I've talked about Project Cars before in the Game Works video. For me, this is a clear cut case of a game that shouldn't be part of a benchmark suite. If Tech Power Up is adding a new bar, removing Project Cars, why not just remove it, period, and replace it with something else? Again, it's that consistency thing. I do believe that consistency is the key. And once again, we'll have a look at another lack of consistency. Over at the Tech Report a few years ago, they've compiled an overall average performance index. However, they have removed Hawks 2, a game which featured very heavy tessellation and heavily favoured Nvidia cards because of that. So the Tech Report simply excluded it from this index. Again, it's not difficult to see why when the GTX 580 was twice as fast as the 6970, when both of these cards should have been within 10-15% of each other. In another Tech Report article, where they determined that Crisis 2 was using too much tessellation, they decided to skip Crisis 2 and focus testing other games, or alternatively, exclude Crisis 2 results from the overall calculation. A little bit later on, they chose to exclude Dirt Showdown, a game which heavily favoured AMD cards, because once again, the results skewed the average pretty badly, and AMD worked very closely with the developers on the lighting path, and we can clearly see that the game ran a lot better on AMD. However, when it came to Project Cars, they didn't exclude it. And when they benchmarked the R9 Fury, that's the normal Fury, not the Fury X, it came in behind the GTX 980. Now some people express surprise at this outcome, given the numbers that they've seen in other reviews, and others zeroed in on our inclusion of project cars as a potential problem, since that game runs noticeably better on GeForces than Radians. Truth be told, this went on for a while, and it took a very, very long time before Project Cars was removed from the scatter plot. In the end, however, the decision was made that the Cars Free Value scatter plots are probably a more faithful reflection of the overall performance picture than our original ones. So he's gone back and he's updated the final page of his Fury review with the revised plots. I'm not really sure why it took so long in this case though. Project Cars is clearly a massive outlier. The GeForce GTX 970 beats the Fury X. So in this case, you've got to say there is no consistency there. And I think this is what annoys people more than anything else. The lack of consistency from site to site, from benchmark to benchmark, from game to game. One of the last things I'm going to talk about is the method by which to do the benchmarking. Now, in the past, it was just all about using fraps, getting the average frame rate. Benchmarking's moved on a little bit since then. Now you've got NVIDIA's FCAT, 
which is a very, very good tool for benchmarking. However, it requires an expensive capture card and that is currently well out with my reach and in fact it is out with the reach of many in the tech press as well. Even though it's a very new method, it isn't perfect and neither is Fraps. Both are good at doing certain things. So this is something I'm going to have to think about. I'm going to have a look at how the rest of the tech press does it and then decide on what is the best way to go forward. The last thing I'm going to talk about is something that may not be obvious. The classic website based technology press relies heavily on getting pre-release cards from both Nvidia and AMD. This is very important to them because day one reviews get an awful lot of hits. A lot of these websites are also dependent on advertising revenue from both of these companies. And more often than not, you will see an advert for the very card that is being reviewed on the same day. Now for me, that's a clear conflict of interest. I just cannot see any possible way how they can give you an unbiased review of a card while also being reliant on continuing advertising revenue from each. The great thing about YouTube is neither Nvidia nor AMD will ever pay me directly. So I don't need to worry about things like that. Basically speaking, Google is who pays me directly. That's what the adverts at the beginning of this video are all about. So hopefully there will never be a conflict of interest there for any of us guys on YouTube. As the YouTube terms and conditions require us to let Google know if we are receiving any kind of sponsorship or any other paid advertisement in the video. So that's one worth thinking about. What it really comes down to is getting trustworthy, balanced benchmarks out there, which I just don't believe really exist in the vast majority of the web-based technology press. And that's really been the point of this video, because all these topics that I've discussed here, the point of it has been so that you guys can give me your ideas on what you think is the best way to go ahead with this. I'm just going to be looking for ideas, things that I maybe haven't thought about before, that sort of thing. And hopefully I'll be getting started before the end of this month. As usual, there will be a bunch of links in the description below and a lively chat as well. I'll catch you later, guys.